The West Division in 2023 belongs to the Salt Lake Shred. DC certainly won the offseason, and I thought going into the season, they were the second best team in this league. Edmund sizes it up and scores! Continuation to Jordan Kerr, and that works! We're, we're excited. We want to win the first points, and we want to win the game. They have that sort of optimized o -line. And it's caught by Johnny Our Rons. offense is just so talented. Really proud of those guys, and really proud of our momentum. Looking forward to even more. Look out for the DC Breeze. Welcome back. It's Swing Pass. I'm Adam Ruffner, and I'm joined, as always, now by Cameron Brock. We've got a lot to get to in this episode. Finally, some off-season news as we inch closer and closer to the start of the 2024 season. Last week, we talked Championship Weekend. This week, we're talking the first-ever Super Series that will be the league's showcase premiere of matchups. Eight games all available for free on the league's YouTube channel. The full schedule is now available at watchufa.com as well as on the league's social channels. But before we get to that whole slate and Cam and I's picks for what matchups we're most excited for, we wanted to touch on the big headlining news elsewhere in the league, and that is the DC Breeze announced their new head coach, following the legendary tenure of Daryl Stanley the past several seasons. They have now announced Lauren Boyle as their head coach going into the 2024 season. Boyle comes in with a slew of experience in various coaching elite platforms over the past decade or so. She brings in a handful of gold medals, a club championship from last fall as the assistant coach of Truck Stop, and a big old rubber stamp of approval from D.C.'s front office, as well as returning players. Quoting Sean Banks, the team's GM, it's safe to say we got our number one. And from the limited clips that I've seen so far and heard of Boyle as she steps into this head signal caller role for D.C., she really seems like she's got the right cut for this position. Not only does she bring in the obvious accolades and I think uh, professional demeanor and just intelligence to the role that demands a DC coaching job. She seems to just have an affect about herself. I mean, you heard it too. She talks in a clip and we'll probably play it right here for you about how she has title aspirations. When they asked her, what would she see herself in five years? She said uh, league champion, but she's also not going to preoccupy herself with the New York matchup, as has been happening in the past several seasons with this Breeze team. I would say that the Breeze in the past has put the New York matchup on this like big pedestal, and it, the game felt so much bigger than it needed to be, in my opinion, for the Breeze. It almost felt like this mountain that we had to climb. Um, the Empire is such a talented program, um, but we need to respect all opponents in that way. So we'd approach every game with bringing our excellence talking about what does the Breeze do well? What do we bring to each matchup? How are we gonna create chaos? And instead of it feeling like this is this big moment, we are now approaching it as being like, this is a game and this is our game plan and we know how to go out there and be the best Breeze that we can be and we get to be the judge of ourselves. So instead of it being, we wanna win one game, we wanna win them all. And we're gonna do everything we can as a staff, as players to work hard and pursue that excellence. My last question isn't really a question, it's more of a fill in the blank. In five years, DC Breeze coach Lauren Boyle will be blank. I'd say a champion. Simple enough? Yeah, yeah. you know it. <laughs> DC has looked like the odds on favorites to challenge the two time reigning champs from New York. However, the Breeze have come up shy in each of the past two East Division title games in 2022 and 2023 coming up short against the Empire in New York in both of those matchups. And Boyle said right away in basically her first statements as head coach of DC, we don't want to put that matchup on the pedestal anymore. We want to set our sights, obviously, on kind of uh, glorifying and respecting all of our opponents and using that as kind of a better map to build towards a championship. Again, this is a DC team that has qualified for seven straight playoff appearances longer than any other team in the league, and yet they have yet to make it to the league's Final Four event even one time. Cam, what are your first reactions to this hire by DC? 
Well, she played for the Indy Red and the PUL, so clearly they knew that they needed to get someone associated with Indy out there in D.C. That's That was my biggest takeaway. Um, <laughs> no, uh, so I admittedly knew very little about Lauren Boyle. Um, like, from a personal standpoint, I knew her association with Truck Stop, and I knew she had been with Indy Red. Um, but like her coaching resume kind of speaks for itself, even, you know, coaching, uh, team USA for, and obviously championship as an assistant coach last year with truck stop. It's great too. truck stop has a ton of crossover with DC breeze. So these players are going to be familiar to her and, and vice versa. So having that familiarity with the team, with the culture is going to be, I think kind of a seamless transition from. Daryl Stanley to her. Um, but as far as the UFA is concerned, um, her experience there as the head coach is at zero games right now. So I'm excited to see what she brings to the table. I'm excited to see um, what changes might take place. And I do love what you've already mentioned about not putting the New York game on a pedestal, her coming out. And the biggest thing I took away from that clip was her saying we need to focus on what makes us who we are instead of trying to worry so much about other people like what do we do well and that is something that can get lost in the shuffle when you have a team who is consistently finishing ahead of you you can get so caught in the weeds about how do we beat this team how do we stop them from being successful in what they like to do and sometimes you forget that one of the best things you can do is actually lean in on your strengths and force them to adjust to you instead of the other way around. It's a, it, it is that mentality that takes you from feeling like you're the underdog who's got a scratch and claw to try to win the game to realizing that your talent and your strengths actually can be something you can force your opponents to react to, even if on the outside people might be seeing them as the favorites. Um, you, you still can force them to have to react to you. And I, I really liked that little nugget from the clips that I saw posted in her uh, her interview. Um, I think this is going to be really, really fun. I mean, Daryl Stanley has been long heralded in the UFA as one of the best coaches in the league, somebody who just, I mean, if you just sit down and talk with him for any amount of time, you will come away from it understanding the game of ultimate better than you did when you started. Uh, I had this experience at Championship Weekend in Madison a couple years ago when I was doing um, some of the coverage for Championship Weekend with him and Ian Toner, and we were just spitballing back and forth, uh, the three of us, and it was so much fun, and I felt like I walked away from that a, a smarter Ultimate player than I was when I went into it, so... This is all very really exciting. Um, it's obviously made even more exciting by the fact that she's going to get the opportunity to coach her first game, which is also the first game of the entire season, I believe, is going to be. And definitely the first Super Series game against Salt Lake. So we'll be able to see right off the bat if anything looks, if everything looks exactly kind of what we've expected from the Breeze in the past, or if there's little wrinkles or things that she has changed and adapted onto the team. It's going to be really exciting. And we know DC is going to have a great team. So I don't know. We'll see what happens. Maybe this will finally get me off and off of my uh, point that I don't have to worry about anyone beating New York. Maybe this coaching change might actually yield uh, some change in my mind. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, in all of that, I think there are two points that I really want to reflect back on. One is what you mentioned about Daryl Stanley and sort of the legacy that he leaves with this DC team. You talk about your experience with them, I think it's a very shared one within the Ultimate community. You know, Daryl is one of the most insightful coaches as far as developing strategy, producing young players that fill into much larger roles after just his season or two with him. Yet I think what his true strength has always been has been his communication ability. When you sit down, you can have about three sentences of dialogue with him. And like you say, you're already learning something new. You're thinking about a different facet of the game in a way that you haven't quite before. I just think his directness of approach and kind of ease of communication is second to none in this sport. It's just a delight really to be able to sit down and share any kind of words on it. And I think Lauren Boyle already kind of shows that that silver tongue quality a bit from just her first interview with the team. It's that kind of 
inborn leadership quality that I think very few people have. And while maybe they didn't always have this as a particular form right now, both Boyle and Stanley, when they approach team dynamics, they just have that authority to them that I think is often imitated, rarely duplicated, right? Like it's just, you know, the real McCoy when it's there, you know, the real thing when it's standing in front of you and both of them have that quality to them. And the other point I wanted to touch on was what you were talking about with DC's identity and kind of that little kernel of truth as to what Boyle was talking about with, we want to develop our own identity and thinking back to the last two elimination games between DC and New York, it's not to say that the Breeze played poor games, right? It's just that New York exceeded them. And it's that sort of heliocentrism, that star power that New York always has and makes these games always have the identity of the empire and their high impact highlight playmaking. And we forget about DC's efforts. We forget about the things that the Breeze do well in these playoff games that sure enough might have them advance against a different kind of opponent. And yet they always get faced up in the bracket of their own division against the greatest team this league has ever seen. And so I digress. I I just want to get back to, I think it's really important that they have somebody directly addressing up front that DC's identity is what's important, not us addressing what New York is doing. I think that that's kind of gotten the breeze in a little bit of a trouble as to you say, kind of getting behind that eight ball, just viewing things in almost a big brother, little brother dynamic where you're sort of starting off in a precarious position as opposed to, hey, this is what we're going to go out and do really well. And you could even feel that in last year's playoff game when New York didn't have the MVP and Jeff Babbitt available and healthy. They didn't have John Lithiau starting in that East Division playoff game. They did have to switch over Ben Yacht from his starting role in defense the past season and a half into his more traditional offensive receiving role. And it felt like instead of DC attacking all of those kind of adjustments and and wrinkles that had presented the Empire late in last season, they sort of tried to play prevent. They, they, They wanted to address what New York might do. And so they push Ben Yacht deep. And what does he do? Sets a league record for a single game and receiving yards and contributes on 16 scores and just goes bananas in New York has the fewest turnovers ever in a full 48-minute game. So, you know, it it just felt like, to get back again to the point, is that DC could really stand to use, I think, a little bit of self-confidence and and derivation from self as to where they're coming from, not always rely on adjusting to what New York is doing, but make New York adjust to them, right? Yeah, and DC is obviously talented. We talk about the talent on New York, but we we know DC is every DC bit is talented. talent. I... Yeah, so it's like it's not like you look at it and you see this huge talent disparity necessarily, but there clearly is a difference when it comes to outcomes. And part of that, I think, has to be attributed to that mental fortitude. And you know, this is a nebulous area where you it's hard to put like any metrics to this, but it just looks like like you said, like they're always trying to adjust to New York instead of trying to make New York adjust to them. And so the way she's approached the, you know, Lauren Boyle's approaching this already, just from in this very brief snippet we have, it it just feels like the she's already trying to plant the seeds to change the culture um, in a positive way. And yeah, I mean, I guess we'll see what happens. Um, fairly or unfairly, she's probably going to be judged a little bit by that very first game, which is against, you know, the Salt Lake Shred, who were, by all measures, the second best team in the league last year. Um, so it will be uh, interesting to see how they perform, uh, but it'll be exciting, too. We'll get a sneak peek at two teams that we expect to be two of the top teams in the league. And with last year's, as you mentioned, the reigning, the reigning coach of the year, uh, versus somebody who, who knows, could be the reigning coach of the year when we're having this conversation a year from now. So um, really exciting. Uh, I'm, I'm very, I am going to move my needle a little bit up for DC now, knowing who their coach is. I'll give them a little bit more of a chance to beat New York. I still feel pretty strongly New York is going to just run through that division, but we'll see. That's why we play the game, right? 
And it is why we play the game. And there do seem to be new renewed wins in DC. And as you were just hinting at, they really get to hit the ground running with the announcement now of the full Super Series schedule going into the 2024 UFA season, starting off with that April 27th battle at Zions Bank uh, National Park. Uh, that will be the site later this season of Championship Weekend. Of course, the Week 1 showdown between the D.C. Breeze and last year's runner-up, the Salt Lake Shred. Battle of the two best offenses in the league. And from there, the matchups do not slow down. The very next week, we have New York traveling to face Atlanta. That will be the fourth time since 2021 these two teams have battled Atlanta. Got one of their matchups way back in 2021's regular season. The last time the Empire lost during the regular season, almost three whole years ago now, they will now get a chance to close out a third straight victory over the Hustle. They've gotten two makeup games in the 2021 playoffs. And then again, last year during the regular season against Atlanta. So, this showdown will be a sort of rubber match that, again, will take place in Atlanta. From there, the rest of the Super Series schedule will be Minnesota at Madison, a traditional Central Division border battle between those longtime rivals. Atlanta at Colorado, a first-ever matchup. Colorado having one of the top defenses in the league last year. Atlanta having one of the most efficient offenses as well as one of the most talented defensive units. We touched on it last week in our defensive specialty episode. That will be one to watch for sure. Colorado will then go on the road two weeks after that to travel to face Minnesota. Another first ever matchup between interdivisional opponents. From there, two weeks later, we have a rematch of the 2023 championship game as Salt Lake will flip the matchup from last season's regular season showcase between New York and Salt Lake where they traveled to face the shred at Zions Bank. This year it will be in Focina Field in New York as the shred will travel to take on the two-time reigning champs. The last two matchups will feature one of which will feature your Indianapolis Alley Cats traveling to face the Colorado Summit. Another first ever matchup i believe that makes three or four I, i'd have to go back and tell if four yep four first ever matchups in this slate of games as well as a whole slate of rivalries but last but not least we have one more final matchup for both new york and minnesota as the windchill will play host to the empire in week 12 the eighth and final game of this super series again all of these games will be available for free live on the league's youtube channel cam you and i have selected two games apiece and funnily enough when we just did this blind neither of us chose the rematch of last year's championship game which really goes to show you the kind of meatiness of these matchups i think but i'll let you take second because mine segues so nicely off of the DC coaching announcement and the game I am actually most excited about and this whole slate of matchups is the very first one between DC and Salt Lake. I just think there's too many good nuggets. These are two teams that are kind of at the peak of hypothetical matchups that we've never seen before in this league. You talk about the runner-up to New York in the East Division. You talk about the runner-up to New York in the league final. You have Breeze and Shred. You have two of the best coaches, as you just alluded to, in the 2023 Coach of the Year, Bryce Merrill, going off against who could be the 2024 Coach of the Year and Lauren Boyle. You have two top three offenses squaring off. You have two of the least turnover-prone teams. You have two defenses who love to get after it in individual matchups. You're going to have Jordan Kerr, Grant Lindsley, and that high-powered, high-tempo shred offense squaring off against A.J. Merriman, Alexander Fall, David Cranston, and this swarming deep breeze defense. There just feels like there's so many toeholds to cling on to in this, and I'm sure there'll only be more as we get further and further towards this matchup. Cameron, what are you most looking forward to in this kickoff matchup between uh, D.C. and Salt Lake? Uh, hopefully seeing Thomas Edmonds play every O point for the DC Breeze. That's what I'm most looking forward to, as I've talked about before. Put that man on the O permanently. Um, 
No, I mean, the, you kind of said a lot of it already, but yeah, it's, you have two, like by most metrics, if you just look at the stats, right, you look at the team stats, these teams pretty clearly are like two and three or at the very least two of the top five teams in the league, no matter how you kind of parse out any, any stat you want to look at. And that's really exciting. And it's a first ever matchup. And one of the things that's kind of plagued DC is they haven't been able to make it to championship weekend is we haven't had the opportunity really to see DC go up against the top teams from the other divisions. And this finally allows us a look at like, okay, what's it look like when DC gets to play the top team out West? You know, we got some Carolina DC matchups last year, but it turned out that Carolina just wasn't the Carolina we were used to. So instead of, you know, facing the top team in the South, it turned out that that was the third team in the South, both by regular season metrics and by what happened in the playoffs. So this really kind of offers us for the first time in a while, like what do they look like when they get to go outside of their division and play a top team somewhere else? And I'll be really curious because they've been playing second fiddle to New York now for a while. And it, we, we kind of have this narrative that goes around every year by like, that might be like, well, they don't make the championship weekend, but they might be the second best team in the league. And I feel like now they kind of get an opportunity to actually go show that maybe they're the second best right. team in the league. So I think that alone adds a lot of excitement. It's the first one on the list. It may, depending on how schedule shakes out, be like even one of the first games of the league. Um, and I couldn't really think of a better one, like a better appetizer to whet our appetites for the rest of the season than to get some high powered matchup like this. But I do have a question for you. We know that Salt Lake and DC have two of the top offenses, but they go about it so differently. So when you look at this matchup, do you anticipate it being a shootout at the pace of what Salt Lake wants to play? Or do you expect it to come more to the breeze side? Is it going to be more controlled? And is it going to be a score that maybe is in the upper teens as opposed to the mid to, mid to high 20s? Yeah, I mean, I think you kind of hit on it, right? If you're Salt Lake, you want a high-scoring, high-tempo game. If you're DC, I think you want to value possession and kind of limit the amount of scoring opportunities that this high-powered shred offense has. I think you have two of the more efficient units, but Breeze want to limit the number of total possessions in the game. They want to make you work for it when they're on defense and on offense. They really want to strain your defensive principles and make you take aggressive looks while they just sit back and play catch against you. And I think that it will be interesting to see if the newly leaded breeze by Boyle will change any of that. If there's any sort of new wrinkles to their game plan, I think you saw in some of their matchups last year, a bit more of an expansion of the deep game. This breeze team over the past couple seasons is one of the least likely teams to huck it and stretch the field vertically of any offense in the league. On the opposite side, you have a shred team who isn't voluminous with their huck attempts, but they're really, really good at knowing who and when they want to pull that trigger with. I think it'll be interesting to see if these teams open up a little bit as they each kind of figure out their footing against a first-time opponent, or if it will see a little bit more of tightness early, adaptation, not wanting to be the first one to make a mistake. I, I don't know what to expect. I think there's also going to be the whole X factor of kind of what you were touching on first game of the season, leading in with all of this hype and promise. You're getting the kind of stage set for what will later be the stage for championship weekend. That That's going to factor into players' minds. Is this going to be a potential uh, uh, preview of a championship game later in August this year. Who knows? I think there's going to be a lot of management of emotions right out of the gate for this game. You talk about this shred team. They love to be pumped up. But as we saw in their last uh, performance of 2023, that can kind of eat them alive if they aren't able to manage those expectations early against a quality opponent in, as what happened at the beginning of that 2023 championship game when the Empire just took over from basically the opening pull. I, if I'm DC, I don't put Thomas Edmonds on offense. I want to play me kind of defense and leading those counterattack drives. The DC offense is too finely tuned of a machine. And I want the shred defense to have to prove it to me that they can actually do something to disrupt the Boxley, Monroe, Roy, Nissen, just throwing attack that this Breeze offense can provide you. I don't know 
that Salt, if Salt Lake has the patience to take on this kind of offense. I don't know that they have a whole bunch of reps against this quality East Division, high efficiency offense. I mean, the shred are really good at playing West opponents and taking that disc away when there's kind of a little bit more volatility in the offensive stylistic approaches. I don't know if that's going to hold up against this DC team if they're motivated and focused and wanting to come out and kind of give an early W to Lauren Boyle's career. You know, I, I th- th- there's just so much going into this game. I it, it feels like two of the most known opponents, and yet given that we've never seen this particular arrangement and the way in which this this matchup is is set right on the starting block of the season. And we don't know what kind of like progressions these teams have made during the off season, what their practices have looked like going up for the several weeks beforehand. Like there's just so many questions that I have that I don't feel comfortable right now making any kind of prognosis. I think DC style of offense favors the matchup because as we talked about last week, Salt Lake loves to play straight up man to man defense and really try to get after it. And it's really hard to use your athleticism to force D's in the small tight spaces. Uh, They really want to be able to get out and run and out athlete you, which is something they're very good at. Um, but DC just doesn't think I give them many opportunities to do that. They don't yeah. air the disc out. They don't let you just run underneath of it and make a play. You have to yeah. be able to anticipate the back shoulder throw, the immediate ratchet around, the kind of uh, ride up the rail if they have that opportunity open. There are similarities to these offenses. Both of them really like that ratchet play in the middle of the field. Mm-hmm. You know, for DC, it's often Andrew Roy doing that kind of movement for Salt Lake. It's one of the Jorgensen brothers. It's just that kind of exposure of the full width of the field and making the the defense, excuse me, aware of covering sort of every single throwing angle possible. I do think you're wrong about Edmonds. You're just wrong. I don't know what else. I mean, the dude completes 98% of his passes. How does that not fit in? How does that not fit in with the, here's it here. You know, this is the last thing I'm going to say. Last thing I'm going to say. Uh, he, you know, it's not to say that he probably couldn't. It was just in year one. It was in year one. You you don't want to possibly pour sand into the finer machinations sure, sure, of that sure. All they, I'm saying. All I'm they saying. They need they develop it over the soft season and put him in? Absolutely. I love Thomas Edmonds, a playmaker. It's kind of one of the pieces that DC has needed over the past couple of seasons. Sure. As you alluded to, they need to stretch I, I'm, the field. I'm on the Edmonds bandwagon. I just had to clear the air on that. Uh-huh. They need to stretch the field, though. Like, if I, I think honestly, one thing DC needs to do this year, if they seriously want to compete for the division title, this isn't about New York. This is about them. They need to be able to stretch the field. They struggle with it. It makes no sense why a team with that many talented throwers and that many talented athletes to throw to cannot figure out ways to stretch the stretch the disc down the field. Um, I'll be very curious to see if we see any more of that in the beginning of the season, or if we're just going to see the same thing we saw last year. I will say, regardless of the outcome of this first game, if I see the same D.C. Breeze offense I saw last year, I will be concerned immediately. They need to find ways to stretch the field and create some uncertainty in the teams they're playing against instead of being so predictable. Because while you can complete all those passes and, you know, lead the league in completion percentage, if you're throwing more passes per possession, you're going to turn the disc over. So, like, you just... You need to find ways also to, just to alleviate some of that pressure. Teams know you want to do that. The throws become tighter, even if you are completing them. If you can act, put any seed of doubt in the defense that there might be something happening deeper down the field, everything else just becomes so much easier. You don't have to be quite as precise. You have room for error. And the way they play right now, they, don't, they, they do it well, but they don't have room for error. If there is error, there is a turnover. And that, that's where they've been running into problems in a very simplified format, of course. But you know what? Let's move on to the next game. Let's move on. We've talked about this game a lot. We we will have plenty of opportunity to talk about DC at Salt Lake as it approaches on April 27th, but I wanted to give you time for one of your choices. Sure. What matchup are you most excited for? So the one I'm most excited for is actually the last one, uh, New York. Well, I, New I York. need to make a stipulation. I'm sorry. I forgot to make our special stipulation was that you can't talk about yourself. You're not allowed yeah, to yeah, make yeah. an indie game for this particular thing. We'll give you like a two-minute – uh, just sort of clearing the air later, but for right sure. now, you're barred from picking your own team. <laughs> That's fine. That's understandable. So there are three matchups on this list that are first-time matchups. I appreciate you trying to say that Minnesota didn't play Colorado because it was a forgettable uh, game. 
but that was um, the one I was thinking on. Yeah, they did go there last year, and they do have a rematch this time in Minnesota, which I will be curious to see how that pans out. Um, but New York at Minnesota is intriguing to me for a few reasons. Uh, New York's clearly going to be the favorite going into that game, uh, but the game is in Minnesota. Um, Minnesota is a different beast at home than they are on the road, as we know. So I think that while that does not close the gap completely between the two teams, it does give Minnesota a little bit to fall back on. Um, it is a new matchup that we have not seen. Um, and the thing that will be intriguing to me, I know there's been some rumblings of like, you know, Matt Rader signed with Minnesota. We'll see where he ends up playing. Um, New York, I've heard some things about some players not potentially being there this year that were there in the past. Uh, it'll be interesting to see at the end of the season when both teams should be kind of hitting their stride and preparing, we would think, for the playoffs for both of them, where they're at. Um, this could... Uh, the thing about New York is uh, you would think Minnesota playing at home, one of the things they always use that eighth defender of the wind as well as any team in the league. But New York is like if you pay attention to their games, they play some of the worst weather games every year. Somehow they get two games a year where it is raining cats and dogs and just windy as all get out. And Jack Williams looks like. There, there is no rain. There is no wind. I'm just going to complete every pass. It doesn't matter. They had a game last year in basically a monsoon in Boston, and it was just so clear that even though it was a messy game, that New York was so much more comfortable playing in that than they were. Heck, their first game of the season against Philadelphia, it was raining cats and dogs, and it looked like it was raining for only when Philadelphia had the disc because when New York had it, they were just punching it in over and over again. My big question for this game will be, can Minnesota make use of that wind at all as their eighth defender? And can they muck things up enough for New York to keep this game close, like we saw with their Salt Lake matchup last year, championship weekend? Or is this going to be a game where New York just proves how much better they are than everybody else? I, that's my big question. I could see it going either way. We know Minnesota is as good as anyone when it comes to polls as well and forcing their opponents to start in terrible field position. Um, so it'll just be an interesting matchup for me. And, you know, the other thing with Minnesota is their coaching staff does as good a job as anyone in the league at game planning specifically for their opponents. So um, for a lot of reasons, I'm really intrigued by this matchup, um, especially since it is at the end of the season when, they, they have enough time to figure themselves out before they get there. Yeah. No, and for as quality of the defenses as New York saw at championship weekend in Austin and Salt Lake this past season, I don't think they really saw anything like Minnesota's ability to stunt at the beginning of drives and really make you operate from a different starting point than almost any other defense does in this league and of course I'm talking about the pulling ability of Sam Berglund and Cameron Lacey excuse me that sets up those Minnesota defensive drives so so well oftentimes pinning opposing offenses deep in their own end zone or simply just kind of scattering the look as to what the opposing offense wants to run I think so many times you saw and I'm sure you were on the field for having a set play in mind with what you wanted to run out against Minnesota and then a uh, uh, pull that rolls a, a direction that you didn't want or it floats a few seconds longer and the defense is able to get down and in position and cover better. Whatever it is, Minnesota just has an ability to kind of throw a monkey wrench into the best intentions of the opposing offense. And I don't know that New York, for as good of opponents as they've faced over the past several seasons, I don't know that they've seen a particular kind of schematic approach like the one Minnesota can bring. And to your point, Minnesota earlier today just announced they will be bringing back their full coaching staff from this past season where the Windchill made their first championship weekend appearance and also were one Joel Clutton macked buzzer beater away from a championship game date with New York Empire. And in talking with some Minnesota leadership players and coaches, they <coughs> They felt like in, in sort of the absolute cosmic brain word I can't say right now um, <laughs> of it all in the aftermath of that semifinals loss. One of the things that 
I heard from multiple people was, you know, Salt Lake took us down. That really sucked. We That was a gut punch on top of a shin kick on top of, you know, the worst news of the day sort of feeling. And yet when I sit back and hi- hypothetical, put myself in the situation of what would we look like against the 2023 empire, we had confidence going into that matchup. We felt like had we won that semifinal game, we were expecting New York and we wanted that game. Now, everyone in the league has, I think, some idea of we want to be the ones that take down New York. And that's all well and good until you're out there having to defend against them and <laughs> embrace the onslaught of breaks that they're going to get you at some point in the game. But Minnesota feels like the kind of opponent that could just have a certain kind of personnel and approach that would match up with New York in a way that might not be anticipated, might not be where you would come from if you were to just look at results, stats, a 10-goal loss to Colorado on the road during last year's regular season and say, yeah, this Minnesota team is going to go punch for punch with the the empire reign that is currently on a 30-game winning streak dating back to the beginning of 2022. Yeah, and the big thing the big thing to watch for in this matchup is definitely going to be Minnesota's offense versus New York's defense as much as we talk yeah, about that's, Minnesota's defense because well, right and, Minnesota and, and was in the bottom half of the league in offensive efficiency last year, right? So like now they were at the top of that bottom half, but like that's if this game gets out of hand, I don't think we're going to see because New York just goes like their offense just can't be stopped. There are going to be turnovers. I, I and I'm not saying they're going to be necessarily a ton, but Minnesota is going to force them to play slower. And it is going to be probably a lower scoring game. And New York plays a lot of lower scoring games because they are patient on offense. They they take, I think last year they had the second or third most completions per score on average from their O-line. Like they, they don't go out there and just score in two or three throws. But the big matchup is actually going to be on the other side where we see New York's defense, which we know is stellar against Minnesota's offense, which you don't know what you're going to get. They're very Jekyll and Hyde. Uh, it seems like they save their best games for us a lot of times where they did, they make all the right decisions. They're connecting on all the throws. And then some weeks we see a stinker like they had at home against Chicago last year where you're like, what happened to this team? Like Chicago struggled uh, throughout most of the last year's season, especially offensively. And they went up into Minnesota, a place where Minnesota seems to never lose. But Minnesota's offense just completely lays an egg in that game. If if we get that version of Minnesota, this could be a blowout, and it could be over by the by the end of the first quarter, even. Um, well, and but, I just so. not to interrupt you too long, but I wanted to agree with the fact that Minnesota struggles with slow starts, and on the opposite side, you might have the fastest starting team in the league. I mean, when was the last time somebody got up on the Empire if it wasn't? Carolina in the 2021 championship game, AKA the last time the empire lost. I mean, you just don't get up and hot start on this empire team. And Minnesota historically does not start very hot on offense. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a big, huge glaring red concern I have for this matchup on the realistic side of the spectrum. I know I just made, kind of a, a logo centric argument for Minnesota <laughs> might match up pretty well, but there's, there's this very real side of man, Minnesota can't have one of their slow starts on offense. Otherwise it's going to be six, one with like five minutes to go in the first. I mean, we saw it too much last year too. They had that game at, at Madison near the end of the season where it looked like Madison was just going to run away with it. And it ha- had it not been for a Madison team that let's be completely honest struggled through last year particularly on offense at times like if it wasn't for them just collapsing in on themselves minnesota would have gone home with a loss that day so we we will see we'll get a chance uh, on an earlier you know game of the week uh for the super series when they do travel to madison where they tend to struggle even though madison hasn't quite had the mystique recently as it has had in years past that mystique still still seems to kind of be there for Minnesota. The Minnesota's been pulling out more wins, but they still have those times in those games where they just look like they're being completely outplayed and like they're lost, especially on offense. So if Minnesota can put up one of their better offensive performances, doesn't even necessarily have to be their best, just a top half of the season for them, and they put out their typical defensive performance that they tend to bring week in and week out, 
they can keep this game competitive. But like you said, New York's a hot starting team. And when they get up on a team, they do not let teams come back. So the biggest thing is going to be, can Minnesota make it to halftime still within one to two goals? If they can, we'll be in for a very exciting second half. If New York ever even gets a three goal lead at any point in the game, I'd say at that time, point, you can almost call it, you can call it right there. I don't think most teams have the power to come back from three goals down against New York, but particularly Minnesota with their offensive struggles. I definitely don't see them being able to overcome a deficit like that. That being said, I am really excited for this matchup because I'm excited to see what does Minnesota's defense do to New York's offense. Even if they're not as successful on the other side of the disc, I think that'll be a really interesting matchup to watch. Uh, But how about your second game? What is your second game that you're looking forward to on the Super Series? I tried to avoid New York matchups. I know we're going to end up talking about New York just an insane amount over the next several months. But the one I kept going back to, the one that's kind of in my perennial, I just want to see this game every year. It's New York at Atlanta. It's the second week of the season. It's the second game in the slate. And it just, again, kind of getting back to the what opponent when I just kind of relax my brain, let some of the stats go off to the side, what opponent in my mind's eye do I feel like can give this New York team a run for its money? And I think it's Atlanta. I know that they have their foibles. I know they can't seem to quite get over the hump there in DC have a lot of similarities for two teams that have never made championship weekend. It really feels like when you start to plow through some of the stats, this hustle team has been a top five, if not three team the past three seasons. I mean, again, they have the last regular season win against New York. They continually battle in these just um, they they continue to take what feels like the hottest team in a given postseason and have to bring them all the way to either single or double overtime and then lose in the most heartbreak fashion in order to be kind of elevated into this elite territory. But they never quite again get that that it's always no cigar. And, and I just I, I like the height on Atlanta. I like their offensive system. I thought Tuba Benson Jaja was probably the runner up as far as coach of the year last year to Bryce Merrill. I thought the way in which he took over the reins from Miranda Knowles and just seemed to improve everything on that roster. I know Bryce Merrill said at one point about the Salt Lake shred that he felt like their 2023 version was just 10% better across the board from 2022 excuse me, from 2022. And to me, that's an indication of coaching. I felt the same way about Atlanta from 2022 to 2023. I just felt like all of the tide went up on offense. They were more efficient and on defense, they knew when to attack better and how to convert their their break opportunities at a higher clip. I just, I I like the way that they come into these matchups. And last year, one of the more under talked about things going into their week seven game about New York They had a game the prior night against Boston where they just took care of business against the glory in Boston, a quality playoff opponent. And the hustle just handled them and then had to go play their second game in as many nights in New York against an undefeated Empire team. The hustle traded for a good two and a half quarters in that game. And then New York, as they always do, took advantage of a couple of just lackadaisical mistakes in the third quarter got a little bit of a lead on some break scores and just kind of carried it from there. Because as you pointed out just a minute ago, they simply do not squander leads. And I think now with an opportunity to host the empire, Atlanta's going to learn a lot of their mistakes. And I just think given that the way that they exited last season, given the kind of opportunities that they got against New York uh, and they'll have other opportunities in this super series to get other quality interdivisional stuff, I just expect a highly motivated hustle team in 2023. And I think that this could be the best version of their team. And we've been saying that now in each of the past four seasons for Atlanta, it just feels like their arrow continues to point up. And I feel like they are the most legitimate competitor as far as being able to just go punch for punch with New York. That's how they beat them back in 2021. That that wasn't New York having an off game. That was the hustle beating New York outright. And we just haven't seen that since. Well, excuse me, pardon me. Carolina did it in the 2021 championship game. So we've seen it 
one other time in almost 40 New York games since the hustle did it. So I, I just think if there's a team that can do it, it's them. I It'll be interesting. I do wonder um, if you kind of look – the hustle didn't play a lot of close games last year. Um, if they're going to beat New York, we know it's going to be close. And um, their last two games of the season were both close, uh, both one-score games. But outside of that, I mean, their games, they were either – winning by a comfortable margin or they had I think one game where they may have even uh lost by a few goals I'm trying to remember but they yeah they lost to the Flyers earlier in the season Mm -hmm. yeah so like they but the thing is um with two of probably their two most notable losses over the last handful of seasons have been in tight games where they have made mistakes down down at the end of the game you think to the huck to Brett Holzmeyer that gets just barely deed by Ben Yacht. And then we know what happens the rest of that game afterwards. We see the drop also by, you know, also a Brett Holzmeyer play, right? A drop by Brett Holzmeyer last year. And, you know, they looked tight that entire game. Um, they looked uncomfortable in that playoff game against Austin from start to finish almost. I think the first few points, that really? kind of, it, really? I, I felt like in the first – half of the first quarter or maybe the whole first quarter they looked like atlanta like they look all year and i felt like yeah. somewhere in around the end of the first middle of the second i can't remember exactly where it was there just seemed to be this turning point where it was so clear that austin was playing loose and just playing austin soul ultimate and atlanta completely tightened up it was like they had built this lead that looked like oh atlanta's just gonna run away at this game and as soon as austin punched back it, it was it was almost like at that point it was over. Like the Atlanta that we had seen all season wasn't there the rest of the game. They they looked they looked like a a lesser version of themselves, and it didn't feel to me like Austin was doing anything to cause that. It looked like a mental fracture. You saw them getting chippy with Austin, which favors Austin in terms of just the way their personalities of their players and the way they want to play. For Austin, the chippiness is fun, and it, and they look forward to it. For Atlanta, the chippiness was, you're annoying. I don't want to deal with this. And it just, we're sitting there watching it with me and some of my teammates as we're up in Minnesota, and we could just see it. We could tell just from the broadcast, they can't afford to get tight in this game. This is a big game. You know, the one thing is it's a regular season game, and we don't know what kind of stakes will be on the table from positioning in their division at this point but it's not a win or go home game. Maybe that alleviates some of that pressure. Um, but it just seems like when the game is close at the end, Atlanta, maybe it's because they don't have as many games that end up being close at the end, but they just don't, to me, seem to handle that as well. One thing I want to point out is um, Matt Smith's coming off of like arguably like his best season ever, which is really hard to say for a guy like Matt Smith. Uh, he just didn't turn the disc over. I mean, he was still getting open almost at will, it seems like, uh, just ageless. Like, it just seems like he's still quicker and shiftier than anyone else on the field somehow. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing, it, do they continue to go down? Like you said, offensively, they were great last year. Um, they were as efficient, basically, as anyone in the league. They, they have one of those offensive lineups that feels like everyone on the field is so comfortable with the disc in their hands. And is so dynamic as well um but but can they win the big one can they win the national televised game the game everyone's going to be watching that week against the best competition they're going to face all year i don't know we like even the playoff game they lost to new york they should have won they looked like they had every opportunity to win that game to go to championship weekend in 2021 and then they just blew it so i i don't know like i Luckily, this is a regular season game, but are they going to feel that pressure because it's the national broadcast game of the week? I don't know. I don't feel like Atlanta responds to that pressure as well as some of these other teams do. And we know New York is perfectly All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. I have to interject here because okay. I think you've, I think you've rewritten a little bit of that playoff game. I think then the second quarter, absolutely. Hustle got thrown out of their rhythm. Austin started to kind of bring them into their – highlight junkie get in your head a little bit talk a bunch of trash sort of 
uh, spirited environment, frenzied environment the Soul succeed in. Sure. However, I think that there were more hustle players willing to punch back against that than I've seen a lot of other times. Bobby Lay and Draco Taylor had great throwing second halves in that game. I mean, they would have had, Draco would have had the game winning assist on a 50 yard hammer yeah, had it sure. just been reeled in. I mean, I don't know how much looser and sort of rolling with the punches you get in a divisional title game than bombing a half field hammer on a potential game winner. So I, I think that the hustle sort of, to your point, came to the inevitable result, it feels like, that they always do, which is coming up short in a big game. But I felt like the actual brush strokes of their performance, the painting itself, was so much different than I've seen in other sort of, I don't want to call them collapses, but it's hard not to say that when you lose a home playoff game last year and you lose uh, having a six-goal lead on New York in 2021. But like, in 2021, that entire second half was basically New York making highlights and Atlanta just sort of trying to hold on. That was not how the hustle looked against the soul going down in the second half of last year's playoff game. And he, I mean, you talk about Matt Smith. He had a no look greatest in the third quarter. You know, like he had one of his best games as a pro in in uh, the elimination game last year, as he did in 2021, too. He's, he's always a big game performer, it feels like. But, you know, getting back to the main thing, I think Atlanta is starting to show a little bit more of that edge that has lacked in some of those more crucial games. Even going back to sort of their rivalry with Carolina, it felt like the Flyers always held that advantage. And then finally last year, other than that one six goal loss, the hustle took care of their other three matchups, winning the season series three to one against Carolina. So I feel like they have more of that that chutzpah, that edge, again, that 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 competitiveness, that fire. And I feel like they get a week two win against New York, and then it's really how how high does this ceiling go? But I I I'm sorry. You were you were just starting to like hey, really, hey, you know really what? like push down on Atlanta there for, for it's, some of the It's easy to throw the fifty ball. yard hammer to the six six guy who's wide open when you have like five seconds left and you have to put the disc in the end zone. And it was a great throw, but you want to talk? I just said it's a, it's a collapse, right? On the other side of the good throw was a drop. So, like, you can tell me about Draco's throw, but you could also tell me about Draco's throw, which he forced in the double overtime, which he should not have thrown. The guy. Yeah, that you know, at that point, it was sort of like there was just a cascade of mistakes that there had started was. to happen, and it felt like there's just an undertow that was going to drag someone down. I mean, even the very last possession. Hustle had the disc, and then they just sort of threw into a very covered player that yielded the disc back to Austin, and then Fitzgerald finds Armour in the end zone, and that's ball game. I mean, I, I, Daniel and I talked about this too. The the, the margins, the the nail thin margins of how we view these teams, given the results, I find sure. fascinating. You know, you. Yeah. Jacob completes that pass. Maybe we have a totally different discernment of what this Atlanta team is. And yet it doesn't really change how they are. They're still the same team, but right. your last collection, we've only got a couple minutes left and I want to give you time. So sure. please. We'll make this one quick, but we are Atlanta again, Atlanta at Colorado, another new matchup. Um, I, as much as I just talked about, you know, can Atlanta win these close games and like Atlanta is supremely talented and I have a ton of respect for like what they are able to do, but I do want to see them in these big games and see how they perform because can they keep them close? And if they keep them close, can they outshine their opponent in those crucial, you know, closing minutes? Are they going to go from the team who looks uncomfortable in the last minutes and finds ways to lose the game? Or are they going to, flip the script and be able to be in some of these tough matchups against good teams and overcome maybe that mental hurdle or whatever it is that's been keeping them from winning some of these close games against quality opponents. Um, Colorado also obviously always presents the physical challenge of going up into altitude and having to deal with that on short notice. It's not, you know, we're not like we're going there all week to acclimate to it. No, you are probably getting off the night before off the plane going the next day and just, all right, let's do this. Um, Colorado having one of the top defenses in the league, Atlanta having one of the most efficient and dynamic offenses in the league. One thing I'd really love to see from Atlanta 
this year is actually using Brett Holzmeier less. He was playing so many points last year, being on the O-line, being on the D-line. And I do think that it's just a guy that big and athletic running that many, you know, that much distance across the field over and over and over again, like that, that wears on you. And even if you feel good, right, it's like when you're playing game six on the weekend of a tournament weekend, you might feel good, but you are not performing at the same level at the end when you've been putting all the, that mileage on your body. I, I would love to see him transition into just more pure offensive role, maybe spelling on defense at the end of quarters or in like crucial situations. Um, allowing some other bodies who are fresher to be out there more, I think would be really helpful for them. Uh, because as we've seen late in games, right, you need to be at your best. And I believe these matchups are going to be close. Having him as fresh as possible at the end of a game, I think will be huge. But I think it's just a really interesting matchup. Great offense versus great defense matchup we haven't seen before. Um, I, I would tend to favor Atlanta in this matchup just because of how smooth their offense can be. Um, and how dynamic they are, but I think it'll be a fun one for sure. Well, and, you know, Atlanta has two of the Super Series games. Colorado has three. These are really amplified matchups for a Summit team, I think, looking to kind of shake off how they finished last season again. They started 5-0. and They lose five of their last eight games of the season, including a first round matchup against LA. They now have one of the toughest schedules in the entire league heading into 2024. This feels like a make or break season a little bit for a summit team that looked like a potential championship contender going into 2023. And now in 2024, they have all these questions, but tell you what, they knock off this Atlanta team at home in any kind of fashion like they did Minnesota last year. And it's gonna answer a whole bunch of those questions. And speaking of a team that just has talent on talent, that's gonna be Colorado. They figure to have back Alex Atkins and Quinn Finer on offense to the most dynamic offensive duos in the entire league. On defense, they're returning some of the best block getters in the entire league. I have really high hopes for Colorado in 2024. And I think this could be a really tough matchup for an Atlanta team, like you say, traveling to elevation and just having to acclimate to a crowd and intense defense and just thinner air at a moment's notice. But we'll put a pause on the Super Series breakdown here for this episode. We'll get into it a whole bunch more on future episodes, but that will do it for this episode of Swing Pass. Cam and I will be back next week and not too long. We'll talk to you soon. Bye now.